Welcome to the podcast, Leslie. Thank you for joining me today. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, I am going to throw your own question back on yourself when you interviewed me on your podcast. Tell us your origin story. Yeah. Um, look, I've been asked this question a few times and uh, always struggle to, you know, I guess, um, figure out how much to add in and uh, how far to go back. But um, I think it's important to go all the way back to the beginning, um, you know, uh, to give context, I was born and raised in Sydney, Australia, and I still live here. Um, first generation uh, Australian born Chinese, and so my parents uh, came over from Hong Kong in the late 70s, uh, early 80s. Um, you know, that generic uh, immigrant story of coming to Australia to new land for new opportunities um, with little money in their pockets and uh, you know, <clears throat> they uh, sort of live that life. And uh, in terms of giving myself and my brother the opportunities that we had, um, they do their best. And uh, by no means did we have, I guess, uh, you know, a, uh, a an awesome upbringing, if you say. But you know, they made it. Um, they made it work, and we were never uncomfortable. Um, but, you know, this sort of paints the picture in terms of like, I guess, this fish out of water type um, experience that I had at a very uh, early age and as, as, as far back as I can remember. Um, being, being an Asian kid uh, growing up in a largely Caucasian uh, neighborhood, uh, you know, even the schools that I went to, primary school and high school, uh, I was the only Asian kid. So uh, there was a sense of, uh, I guess, not fitting in and, you know, uh, maybe a underlying desire to want to fit in to some degree um, and a lack of identity, if you will. So I guess uh, a lot of my early formative years were, was sort of painted in this guise of um, jumping from one identity to another, uh, trying to fit in um, to different, you know, uh, groups and demographics and um, identities and whatnot. Um, you know, whether it was, you know, the kids that uh, played video games uh, and were heavily into that or, you know, a cool kid in the cool cliques or, you know, the, the, the kids that um, experimented with drugs and alcohol at an early age and whatever it was, um, I always felt a sense that um, I needed to fit in somehow. I needed that validation. Um, <clears throat> outside of that, I suppose, um, being in an Asian uh, household, there was pressure to be, be a certain way to, to, you know, uphold respect and, um, you know, uh, go down a traditional route of study just so that um, we didn't have to work as hard as our parents uh, from a, you know, a laborious standpoint, from a hands-on work standpoint. They wanted us to work in, um, in offices and things like this. And um, I think that, you know, you had a similar experience, Jin, with your parents, um, you know, wanting you to do uh, a, a certain thing or a, go into a certain type of career. Um, but I left school sort of not really knowing um, what I wanted to do, who I was and uh, what life was going to be outside of this, you know, uh, very regimented, you know, uh, schooling um, period of my life. And um, I just jumped from like job to job for, for a long time. I did uni for a couple of years, but I knew it wasn't for me. I studied finance and economics and um, I just hated every single second of that. Um, and I just could not get myself to sort of go through something that I just did not believe in. It was something that like I sort of held in myself for a, at a very young age. Like um, I'm a very practical person uh, in a sense in, in that I will not do things for the sake of doing things without questioning and without knowing why. And um, university was one of those things for me. I, I did it until I just simply could not. I, I knew it was the biggest uh, waste of time for me. So anyway, I mean, years of just jumping around and doing uh, odd things here and there. I, I landed in you know, the, the finance industry, uh, one of the big banks uh, in Australia. Um, because, you know, it was the right thing to do. Uh, finance was one of those uh, great industries that uh, our parents wanted us to get into. Um, and I wanted to make my parents proud. And, um, you know, I spent almost 12 years there. Um, yeah, and I did really well, you know, from a conventional sense, from outside looking in, um, I was really successful. I made a lot of money and I continued to, um, you know, I could have continued to climb this um, corporate ladder and continue to be, 
um, quote unquote successful in that regard. But uh, at the same time, you know, this, this, um, this itch uh, or this stone in my shoe of, you know, wondering what life was truly about was still there. Like, although I was really good at what I did uh, in my job, I still hated it. And I did hate every moment of it. Um, and, you know, again, the, the types of things that I sought to uh, escape from this, uh, this reality that I was sort of pushing myself into was like drugs and alcohol, antidepressants and all these sorts of things. Um, <clears throat> really just to not have to face those questions that uh, I sort of needed to face for myself, um, you know, asking why I was doing what I was doing and what, what it was that I potentially wanted in life outside of this, you know, mundane nine to five that I was, um, that I was doing. Um, but I guess, you know, uh, things came to a head in 2013 when um, a routine uh, checkup at the doctors, uh, you know, for something that was like very minor in my mind, it was nothing major. Uh, I was always, I always thought that I was a healthy person, but um, this checkup, it resulted and came back with a, with a cancer diagnosis. And um, really, it was one of those things that were, uh, came out of the blue and just um, really pulled the rug from underneath my feet. And uh, yeah, it shifted my, my life uh, trajectory for sure. Like it was one of those moments where I sort of felt, um, you know, I was given the ultimatum. I had to ask myself those hard questions. Um, and yeah, so that sort of set me on a, on a pretty long sort of journey that, that continues on to this day of self-discovery and um, just figuring out who, who I was and what I represented as an individual um, and what sort of um, inherent values and principles uh, I innately held like underneath all the layers of uh, cultural and societal conditioning. Um, so I guess, yeah, that's like sort of the condensed version of, of my story. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it up to you, which sort of thread you want to pull. Yep. Many threads out of that. Thank you for sharing. And we will dive into all of those parts. Now, one thing that I would love you to share is more about the Asian culture, because mm. yes, I'm, Australian Chinese as well. My parents are from Malaysia. I would say, as I shared with you, that I don't think my parents were super strict, but I really stood my ground as well. But I do see a lot of Asians go out there with a lot of pressure. But can you give me your view on the Asian culture? Because I think it's good for other people to understand because we both live in very multicultural societies. Totally. Um, yeah, like I said, uh, I think generally speaking, and, um, you know, if you uh, look from the outside in, um, the Asian culture is quite conservative, and uh, we are about uh, respect and honour. And, you know, um, we are taught very valuable values in my mind, you know, in terms of like how to appropriately act uh, in society and be. And I, I take a lot from that, um, you know, as I grow up. Some, some things uh, I feel are a little bit redundant, but, you know, uh, this is, I guess, tradition in some sense. Um, in terms of my immediate experience of it in my family, I, I'm quite similar to you in that my parents weren't overly strict, but there was like a sense of, when I reflect back, it was more like a, a pressure that I put onto myself. Um, and that may be from, you know, my my aunt and uncle and my cousins. So um, backstory, my parents sort of followed, um, you know, my dad's sister over here from Hong Kong. Um, so they came over first and sort of laid the platform for, uh, you know, more of their siblings to, to come over from Hong Kong. Um, <clears throat> and my dad and my mum, you know, came over and followed. And um, I had three cousins that were older than me. And academically, they were like, you know, um, 90 plus, uh, the highest percentile. And I guess they, they had a lot of pressure on them put on uh, from my aunt and my uncle. And, um, you know, we spent a lot of time with them because we didn't have uh, much family outside of those guys. So growing up, you know, we'd see them like at least once, twice a week. And I'd always see these guys, you know, doing so well academically and um, being praised for um, their efforts and, and their results. Um, and, you know, I felt like my own academic journey was like a, a conscious but an unconscious choice at the same time in that I was 
a great student, you know, top of the class up until I chose not to, you know. And I think it was probably in year eight or nine, you know, from then onwards, I sort of like chose a different path. And, and like I said, this sort of plays into this needing validation and wanting to fit into like, you know, different cliques and groups at school that meant I needed to, you know, uh, show less commitment to schooling and all these sorts of things just so that I could, could fit in. Right. And um, that was, you know, the, one of those things that sort of, it sort of alleviated a little bit of like anxiety and uh, like that need for validation for me uh, enough that I continued to chase it in, in, in different guises. Right. Um, so long story short, like just to wrap it um, in terms of the question that you asked, you know, um, there is a lot of inherent pressure I feel from, from um, being, you know, uh, of this cultural background, just because of, um, the types of expectations, you know, from a general standpoint that are sort of stereotypically laid upon us. Um, my parents were pretty, pretty cool, um, you know, underneath that, um, just to say that, you know, uh, they really understood when I said that I don't want to waste their time and money for them sending me to university when I didn't want to do it. You know, I truly knew that there was something I didn't want to do. And they, they understood that, you know, they didn't really want to break me in, in that way, I guess. So, um, so yeah, um, it's one of those things. I think it was half, half, like uh, a lot of my story, I feel there were a lot of, you know, um, mental stories that uh, had built up in my own mind uh, rather than from direct, um, you know, influence and pressure. Mm -hmm. And do you feel, were your parents supportive from a young age, especially around the emotional aspect? Or was it very much that you achieve mm. through your results and working hard? Yeah, I, I don't feel like there was um, a huge emotional connection, to be honest, uh, growing up. You know, like I have a great um, relationship with, uh, with my mum uh, right now. Uh, with my dad, it's like very, it's quite cold. And I think that that's his sort of approach to things. He's one of those guys who's, um, you know, he'll indirectly, um, you know, praise you and he won't you know show emotion too often um and i sort of adopted that i think you know and like you know i think that growing up it was uh far removed just because they were working multiple jobs and um they weren't they were hardly home um so that i guess that emotional layer wasn't really there uh it was quite surface level stuff i would say mm -hmm. yeah and did they make you learn piano and violin like most <laughs> Asians? <laughs> no, actually, I, I was like, I think I was actually one of the few that actually didn't um, get, get um, I actually had the choice not to, um, you know, learn a musical instrument. I look back and I sort of regret it, but, you know, um, I wish they sort of did, but no, they didn't. <laughs> so you went to, you did go to university in the end. Mm. Yeah. And you got into finance now. I feel like sometimes when people just give me their job title and don't elaborate with some excitement, and obviously you've told us that you hated your job, but you were good at it. I do sit there and go, do you actually like your job? Because it is such a broad topic, but can you just delve into what kind of finance were you in? Yeah. Uh, so I was in superannuation and investments. So super exciting already. Um, but uh, in in that space, uh, I started off, you know, entry level, um, and uh, there was really a foot in the door. But um, I spent a couple of years just sort of um, uh, floating around in administrative roles until I set foot into um, project management space, where I was basically uh, delivering projects for, um, I guess, regulatory changes within the bank and things like this. So just major changes that sort of impacted. Um, my division, which was uh, the operations space. Um, and outside of that, I guess, uh, I dabbled in uh, quite a lot of management and mentorship and um, coaching and, uh, and yeah, uh, just generally in this space. Um, and towards the tail end, there was uh, a lot of technology as well. So as you know, uh, technology became a bigger player in, in the bank. Um, so yeah. And was it just that you knew that this wasn't your path or 
Can you tell us a little bit more about what it was that you hated about it? Was it the environment, the people, the values? <laughs> Quite a lot of that stuff, actually. Um, look, to be honest, look, uh, I went in there um, not knowing that it wasn't um, a calling, you know. I went into taking the entry-level job because I knew that there were avenues to, to climb and progress, you know. Um, and I think that was something that my parents really wanted me to or see me do. Um, <clears throat> so I did that. Um, so much of the job uh, really didn't align with my personal values in that uh, a lot of the people that I interact with, they, they care more about, you know, um, what affects the bottom line rather than what uh, the right thing was to do. You know, and I think this is something that like a, a lot of the time I sort of use the analogy of, you know, um, Band-Aid fixes versus recognizing root cause. You know, there's a lot of that that happens. And like, I understand that the decisions like that that happen in big corporations, you know, they're driven from the, bot at the top down. But at the same time, you know, you sort of lose sight of what the, um, you know, the intention of each project or each, um, you know, action really is, you know, at the end goal, we're trying to help customers and uh, make a better experience from them and, and things like this. But um, a lot of the time I saw that those sorts of values were swept under the rug um, to make ends meet from a financial standpoint. So I didn't really agree with that. Um, and, you know, a lot of that sort of just stemmed out through the way that I you know, interacted. Like I said, I, I was um, very good at my job. I was successful as a, uh, one of the, you know, most experienced project managers in my space for, for some time. And um, my voice was um, influential in some, like, you know, if you could say that um, in some regards. But um, at the same time, a lot of people didn't like to hear what I was saying, just because it was, um, I guess, controversial, and it didn't align with what was um, what the business overall is trying to trying to achieve, I guess, when it comes to like um, the bottom line and things like this. So I, I tended to rub people the wrong way, especially towards the end of my um, tenure there. Um, but to that, uh, uh, by that time, I really it didn't really bother me. Uh, I just really wanted to express my truth and like act in in the best. Um, I guess. I wanted to act on behalf of who I thought we were trying to work for at the end, which was the client and not so much, you know, trying to fill our pockets more and more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you take me through when the depression started to hit or when you started to take dep any depressants and mm. get into the alcohol and drugs? Yeah. I mean, alcohol and drugs was quite early. I started, um, I guess, you start binge drinking in high school. So that was like, I think I was like 16 or 17, started smoking cigarettes and things like this. And I think that was more like at parties and things like this until it turned into something that was um, more regular. And uh, that, that sort of played um, quite a significant part in, in most of my, you know, um, I would say most of my twenties, you know, um, up until I got diagnosed with cancer. Um, up until I was uh, 28 years old, um, <clears throat> I had stopped cigarettes earlier than uh, than that. But yeah, the drinking was quite consistent. Um, with experimenting with drugs again, it was probably early 20s when I actually started, and that sort of rolled on, um, you know, for quite a few years. And um, there were a few years where it was quite heavy, and um, I did it quite regularly. Um, all the drugs? you know. So I was smoking weed and um, cocaine and things like this. So, yeah. Um, I speak to a lot of people on. in the finance industry who seem to get into cocaine. Yeah. I mean, it was, um, it was just one of those things. Um, it's, it's part of the culture a little bit, I suppose. Um, so, yeah, it was just one of those things that it, it seemed very, um, you know, off the cuff that they would just say, you know, we're going out for drinks and we're just going to have um a, a little bit of fun with with cocaine and things like this so you know um it didn't feel too uh, illicit or, or or wrong or um or anything like this um especially in that space and um, when you look back on it hmm. knowing what you know now 
why do you think you got into the alcohol and the drugs? Oh, it's just to escape, to be honest. Like, like I said, I, I always had some, some sort of inkling, whether it was, it was probably more like a, um, an emotional inkling rather than like an intellectual one. I really didn't understand what it was and I didn't really care or didn't want to, um, you know, delve deeper to, to understand that a little bit more. So, um, it, it scared me to to have to face those sorts of things because I knew that you know ultimately if I'm, if I'm re- reflecting back it meant that uh, some of these identities and um, uh, the the ego side of me would have been shattered and um, I'd probably lose that so um, I think ultimately when I look back that's why I sort of um, wanted to escape through those uh, avenues right um, and it did give me momentary escape so mm. yeah. I just have a random question for you as an Asian, as a fellow Mm. Asian, can you tolerate alcohol? Uh, I got pretty good at it. I got pretty good (laughs) at it. Yeah. At the start, I wasn't very good at it, but, um, yeah, I got pretty good at it. There's this, um, well, I cannot tolerate it and I just Mm. will not drink. I used to as a teen, but it was Mm. just so hit and miss. And I think I've only ever been happy drunk once, but it's the whole alcohol alcohol dehydrogenase enzyme you meant to have two and a lot of um i think indigenous australians maori islanders and asians are lacking one of the enzymes i'm Mm. definitely lacking one if not two of them (laughs) my blood pressure will drop i'll get sick i don't know what's on the cards for me even if it's like a quarter of a glass i don't know what's going to happen so yeah, sometimes, and I go bright red, and I can see other yeah. Asians that that happens to. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I'm actually yeah. having fun. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I got the red face. I got the red face, but um, I have like darker, a uh, dark complexion, so it was like uh, easier to hide. I think so. <laughs> oh, that's handy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you drink now? No, I don't. So mm-hmm. basically, since I got uh, diagnosed with cancer, I haven't drank since. Um, so yeah, so. Mm-hmm. It's been about seven, eight years now. Right. We'll get into that a little bit more down the track. What about depression or now I just want to distinguish between depression and taking antidepressants. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. And like, uh, I guess my story is like the perfect picture of this because I, like I said, I I did feel like, you know, there was something amiss in my life, but I, I, I never like, I was never like, I guess, overwhelmed um, from a mental standpoint in terms of these negative stories that I was telling myself. Do you know what I mean? Like they were there, but I still operated um, relatively well. And I would say like uh, at a decent level, um, but they still swelled around in my mind, uh, these defeating thoughts. And, you know, um, I, I remember distinctly, I don't even remember how old I was, but I remember just going to the GP and if I, if I had to put it, it must have been like in my early 20s or something, you know, I, I went to the GP and I, and I just said that I think I might be depressed. And he just asked me a, a simple, like two or three questions, you know, like, uh, do you have, do you always feel sad or you don't feel like you have hope or, and, and the final question was like, you know, do you have, uh, have you ever thought like suicidal thoughts? And, you know, um, I couldn't really discern between thinking these suicidal thoughts, which I had versus actually practically wanting to act that out. Right. I never wanted to do that, but I'm sure, sure enough, like I've thought about these things. Right. So I just answered yes. And that was as easy as it was for me to get the prescription for antidepressants. And I can't remember what they were. I just, I remember that I just took them home and I'm just like, hopefully this will make me feel better. And I took it for a few days, maybe, maybe a week. And I just remember feeling like my body was just completely rejecting it. Like I just did not feel well. Um, and it was the sign that just told me to stop taking this stuff because I just didn't need it. And it was doing something to me that I just, my body just didn't want. Um, so it was a short stint on, on the antidepressants. And really it was like, um, like a Hail Mary for me almost just to say that, look, um, I feel like crap and uh, I want to get out of this rut and I didn't know how. And um, 
I, I, tr I put my hands and my trust in the, in the professional. And, um, and yeah, I, I just figured it wasn't for me. So, you know, um, life went on. What do you think a better question would be for practitioners and therapists out there to ask someone who was in the position that you were in? Yeah, it's a tough one. It's a tough one. I mean, I, when I look back, I feel like if I had a bit more, um, you know, emotional uh, awareness, then I wouldn't would have been able to discern for myself or at least explain um, what I was feeling a little bit more. Um, I feel like the questions that were asked were very black and white and, and quite, and then they were coming from an intellectual place, you know, which is fine. I think like you need to be able to, you know, explain it at an intellectual level because that's what communication is for. But I think that there, there needs to be a deeper inquiry into, you know, the root of it. And, and perhaps it's not the place of the GP to, to question, but perhaps it's like, pointing me to someone who can like a psychologist or someone who can really converse with me uh, at that emotional deep level or lead me down that road at least a little bit um, so that they can better understand where I'm coming from and like uh, better um, I guess diagnose what it is that I actually had which you know who knows. Mm -hmm. So just moving forwards to when you were 28 and you had that routine checkup at the doctor mm. When you look back, did you have any signs of a potential cancer? No, look, like the only, like I said, the only reason I went to get a checkup was, so a bit of background, when I was growing up, I always had like, you know, uh, nosebleeds periodically, like every now and then I just get nosebleeds and, um, you know, uh, I'd go get the uh, checkup at the GP, um, you know, my parents would always like get me checked up and just, it was fine. Uh, all the way throughout my childhood and even into my teens and my early twenties, like it never really stopped. Um, so the the thing and the symptom that sort of prompted me to go get a checkup was I had uh, little traces of blood uh, in my phlegm, but it wasn't a lot. Um, so when I first noticed it, I was like, okay, I'll get nosebleeds every now and then, um, nothing to worry about, but it was persistent for about a month, um, you know, day on day. So I thought, you know, this is um, not normal. This isn't something that has happened before. So I better go and check it out. And um, yeah, that was the only real symptom. Like I felt healthy. I felt good. Uh, there was no real sign outside of that. So, um, so yeah, that was the only thing that pointed me towards getting checked out. And I had no idea that it would turn out to be cancer. Mm. Can you tell us what sort of cancer it was? Yeah. Uh, so it was called a uh, nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Uh, and basically it's, uh, it was a tumor in between my nasal passage and my throat. So in between that space there. And what went through your mind when you got this diagnosis? Oh, um, it was, it was crazy actually. I mean, I was at work, um, when I got the phone call and I know I was waiting for the results of a biopsy. Um, and I was at work and I was doing a presentation, um, to a number of leaders and uh, I saw my phone started vibrating and it was a uh, random landline number, number. And I thought, okay, this is, this, this is it. I need to take this call. And I had to stop mid um, preso, step out of the room, take the call. The doctor or the specialist basically apologized first for not telling me in person, but he had to tell me he was interstate for something. And he just dropped the bomb. and. Um, yeah, I mean, I was in disbelief. I, I, I just, I just couldn't believe it. Like, um, like I said, I, I would never have thought that it was cancer. Um, so, um, it really shook, shook me up. Like, I just cancelled that meeting. I went home uh, straight away, and uh, you know, really, I, I didn't have much time to emotionally, um, you know, process what, what was going on. Uh, I just knew I had cancer. I've never really known much about cancer. So, cause you know, uh, my, not many of my, you know, family or relatives have, have really gone through it or have not known of, of, of it much. So I don't have much, you know, indirect exposure even to, to it. So as, as soon as I heard the word, you know, it, it was dire for me, you know, um, cancer 
for someone who doesn't know much about it, doesn't know like, you know, whether there is a survival rate to it or whether there's, there are levels to it or, or stages rather. Um, and, and yeah, I just thought the worst uh, straight away. I just thought the worst. Um, so it was, it was tough. It was like, you know, um, one moment just living life um, quite autonomously, you know, just going through the motions and the next moment, um, in my mind, I was faced with my, my own mortality. Um, and then, you know, straight from there, I was thrust into seven, eight months of um, cancer treatment. You know, there wasn't much respite from there. It went, you know, straight into that. So again, um, I really didn't have much time to process uh, the whole experience until, you know, much after, um, once, you know, uh, treatment had finished and I was in that, that mode of recovery. Mm -hmm. What else was happening in your life at that time? Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, I always tell the story like, um, you know, a couple of weeks prior to the diagnosis, I had just, um, purchased my first property with my, um, then girlfriend, now wife. And, um, I had just, uh, got the promotion that I felt like was the dream job for me. So, um, things were, you know, seemingly looking up, but um, I guess the prospect of just having signed my name against a mortgage and then having to take seven to eight months off work was a bit, um, was a bit of a worry and a, uh, something that built a bit of anxiety in myself. But, um, but yeah, those are like, I guess, like the major things that were happening. Mm -hmm. And so during this period when you were having the treatments, what was going through your mind? Was this the turning point in your life? Um, it was, it was just strange. I mean, firstly, it was just like a, a, uh, an interruption in the rhythm that I had, like, you know, like I said, been, been going through the motions, you know, this nine to five living for the weekend, um, escaping on the weekends, getting drunk and all this sort of thing, and then jumping back into the fray. Um, and that, that quickly changed to, you know, I didn't have to go to work anymore, but every day for the first 30 odd days, I had to go into uh, radiotherapy and get, you know, radiotherapy on the area. Um, and then after that, I'd have to go see the oncologist and get my chemo done. And after the chemo, I was just at home and like, I just had so much time on my hands. And, um, you know, my dad was looking after me. He took um, time off work to look after me. And um, yeah, it was just a complete different sort of space that it put me into you know I, I've, I found a little bit of space in there and um, I was able to reflect a little bit and that's when it started sort of moving for me and um, I think you know it wasn't a particular point in time it was quite gradual um, like most things are in terms of revelations like this but um, uh, as a young man going through the treatment I was assigned a psychologist as well to sort of help me through the stress and anxiety of you know everything that comes with cancer and um, she recommended meditation to me. And it was the first time that, um, you know, meditation was something that she, re that I had, you know, really dabbled in it. And, um, you know, it took me about 18 months, you know, on and off to develop a um, consistent practice. But this was really, when I look back, the foundational, you know, tool and practice that I took that has truly transform my life to, you know, the life that I live now today in being, you know, someone who builds and designs and teaches meditation and like builds uh, workshops and uh, has an online program and things like this. So, so yeah. And that came out after the cancer diagnosis. Did you return to work or did you transition into? Yeah, I, I returned to work. I, um, I returned to work after uh, treatment and I stayed there for, you know, um, probably another five odd years before, you know, um, I practically put in place the things that I needed to do to, you know, exit corporate. So, um, like I said, I was still, um, I guess, uh, cognizant enough to understand that I couldn't just get rid of this job that um, was sustaining my life, plus not knowing exactly what I wanted to do with my life. So, um, it was a very slow process of transitioning out of uh, my corporate job to, you know, founding my own business and running my own business and things like this. Um, you know, it, it was a, it was a long process. I started simply writing every day. 
um, and I created a blog and I put that up every day for I think about 18 months I wrote one piece every day for 18 months and that's how I sort of started like this was just like a cathartic process for me to sort of inquire um, within really unpack these old stories and just understand what was going on inside me you know outside of the noise and um, you know busyness of the outside world and and that sort of like opened a lot of doors for me like in terms of my my mind and my perception and how I saw um, the world in front of me and how I experienced it so Mm. I want to go back into the cancer diagnosis a little bit Mm. I'm curious as to how your parents reacted and has that then resulted in any change in your relationship Mm. um I think it's with my mum, uh, she was, she was pretty indifferent, um, uh, most of the time that she was like, like, obviously she was upset for me and, um, she was quite helpful throughout the whole process. Uh, with my dad, he is, I feel like he's one of those people who sort of faces like hard times with just like, a like, I guess the guise of, of strength and, um, you know, we'll get through it. And he was, he was quite, um, he was quite cold, I would say, when, when I first, when we, when we first sort of told him about it, he was sort of just like, it's happened, just deal with it type of thing, um, without showing much emotion behind it. And um, it sort of hurt me at that time. I, I can recognize that, you know, uh, I was wanting a little bit more from him emotionally, like support wise. And then I look back, you know, um, the whole time that he was sort of caring for me full time uh, throughout my treatment process, he was uh, very caring and nurturing. But then to me, it became like quite overbearing. You know, I truly just wanted my own space when uh, he wanted to be the guy that, um, you know, was a help, you know, essentially the guy that, uh, held my hand and lifted me out of this dark time, so to speak. But all I was truly after myself, what I found was, you know, just a bit of silence, some space to myself, just to unpack what is happening. Um, so that's, I think that sort of hurt our relationship a little bit, to be honest. Um, and, you know, since then, you know, um, I have made peace with that and forgiven him because I understand where he's coming from. You know, I understand. Um, the person that he is and how he is based on uh, what I know of his upbringing. And um, I can, I don't judge him for that. I just know that he cared for me at the end of the day and he had a way of doing it. Um, it, it was, you know, abrasive to me, but you know, um, each to their own. Uh, I can't expect him to do what I wanted him to do or not do. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I've, you know, made peace with it and forgiven him like you know at least in my own heart so so yeah yeah that's good that's one of those milestones that I say I know when my client has done the deeper work is when they come from a place of understanding as to where the person who perhaps hurt them or annoyed them um no longer does anymore because they truly understand and they see them for exactly who they are Mm. yeah 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 um, For sure. So the other thing was you mentioned that the cancer diagnosis, you see that as quite a fateful event in your life. I just had to mm. think about that. Sorry. <laughs> That's right. Can you tell us why you feel it was a fateful event in your life? Oh, look, I've, I've had so much time to reflect on it and talk about this that, um, you know, when it boils down to it, you know, the story that I tell about my origin and like how it sort of culminated to that point, it really was that point uh, in the road where I simply couldn't ignore anymore. You know, I've, I've had, like I said, like I explained uh, so many little moments that I can recollect uh, in my life, in my formative years where I could have turned and faced the questions, the hard questions and really inquired within and really, you know, Um, sought some sort of deeper emotional understanding of who I was Um, but I didn't want to or I just chose not to for whatever reason at the time and um, you know 
if you don't learn the lessons that uh, you know uh, the universe is serving you, then it's going to continue to come back until you learn the lessons. And um, I always say that that was the one that I, I simply could not ignore because you know, like I said, uh, it, it's a pretty tough one that really um, pulled the rug from underneath my feet and just turned my world upside down. Um, all the other ones just seemingly weren't impactful enough uh, from my perspective, I suppose. Um, so yeah, uh, it was an absolute blessing in disguise. Um, it was one of the greatest moments of my life, I would say. And I say that all the time to people and they uh, are kind of shocked. But, you know, if I didn't have cancer, I would probably still be doing what I was doing back then and being miserable and living a miserable existence and uh, truly not knowing um, much about who I was underneath this, like, you know, pretend persona of um, high flying businessman. Mm -hmm. And would you say you're a different person? I think we'd change every day, but are you yeah. a significantly different person to who you were when you were 28? And how many years ago is that now? Uh, so 28, it would have been about seven, eight years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and 100%, I'm a different person. Like you said, I'm a different person every day. And I, I truly look back to the, the, the day that has passed and, and, I've been, uh, and I'm a different person. But uh, looking back, you know, um, prior to my diagnosis, absolutely, I was a different person, you know. And that sort of um, is evident through the things that I do uh, the, the company that I keep and the amount of people um, that used to be in my life back then for all uh, a myriad of different reasons who, you know, no longer feature in my life, um, you know, for me to just protect, you know, I guess this, this level of uh, energy that I now hold within my life. So uh, yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, I'm, a, I'm a absolutely a different person from, from uh, prior to the diagnosis. And what about your relationship, if you're allowed to share your side of the story, because your wife isn't here with us? Mm. Um, what about that? Because that's quite a significant thing for her to go through as a supporting partner yeah. and to support you through all of these life changes as well. Are you able, yeah. able to shed any light from your side? Yeah, for sure. I mean, she's been really supportive. She's always been a very supportive person. And, I, you know, I always reflect upon this as well in terms of like um, <clears throat> how much a relationship can teach about um, uh, about you and vice versa. And I, I think that we spoke a little bit about this on, on, on our podcast. And I think that, um, you know, it's a reciprocal thing and it needn't be necessarily uh, intimate relationships. But um, I think when I look back, even to the point where I got diagnosed, like, the thoughts that were going around in my mind in terms of the relationship was like, oh, is she going to leave me now because she doesn't want to like be with this dude who's going to die from cancer or something like this. So that was that was like my immediate thoughts on the on the day of diagnosis. I remember I went back to her place and um, those were the, like the types of questions I wanted to ask her. Um, but you know, even to this day, like you know, supporting me emotionally through this whole change, like. Um, understanding that, you know, my own priority no longer lied in anything outside of myself, you know. I think that's a lot of the time that's tough for people to hear, especially in an intimate relationship, you know. Um, when I was basically saying that I am my number one priority and um, not anything else, uh, nothing else, you know, uh, can, you know, uh, can be higher than, than that and my commitment to that. Um, when she didn't, she didn't, she understands that, you know, uh, and I think from an egoic sense, I can understand if like, you know, that would be hurtful um, if someone said that. And, you know, even me transitioning out of a very well-paying job uh, into running my own business that, you know, uh, transparency, I'm, I'm obviously not making as much as I did in, in the financial industry, uh, not by any stretch, but, you know, the, the smile on my face and the um, the amount of joy that I feel in every moment of my life is just, you cannot compare it. Um, she has, uh, you know, supported me through every iteration of who I, uh, who I am and who I was and who I'm becoming, um, you know, you know, unconditionally, uh, which is awesome. It, it's really cool. Um, 
it's one of those things that really have grounded me and um because i always say that the the path that i'm walking and the you know the the rabbit holes that i'm exploring i could really go down deep uh, if someone didn't hold me back you know and really pin me down and anchor me into like some semblance of reality um so she has been that for me uh throughout the whole process uh which is great and i think that she herself has um grown through the process as well you must also grow together i think otherwise there's always going to be naturally a um you know a progressive growing apart if you don't grow together um so yeah she's grown as well i think uh you know not without you know uh conflict i guess but uh i think that that uh, in itself is also a necessary part of a healthy relationship in terms of you know really expressing oneself and you know um penetrating that egoic way of thinking just to you know really just express and um try to be honest and understanding and transparent um simply to share one's point of view as best as possible so um yeah it's been not without its uh you know twists and bumps and you know all that sort of thing but you know we would i guess we wouldn't have it any other way yeah oh she sounds like an amazing person yeah for sure so you were exposed to meditation through a psychologist and now you're kind of dedicating your life to this but mm. from what i understand it's not not just solely meditation yeah Can you that's tell right. us a little bit about what you think this life is all about yeah i think um meditation has really taught me a lot and i take a lot um of the principles uh that are involved in meditation and apply that in everyday life and um you know it's not so much just about you know sitting and um you know quote unquote doing nothing i i i really feel like there's a level of ignorance when people think that uh meditation is doing nothing because when you intentionally and consciously choose to sit and meditate that is an action in itself um but what is it what it has taught me is really i guess um a level of dif- discipline uh to the practice and not so much of practice of meditation necessarily but the practice of life um i think each moment is an opportunity for us to practice something um and there's so much that can be told in that but like you know i refer, i refer to a lot of um you know eastern philosophy and i i really uh, resonate with zen buddhism um you know i spent some time living in in japan for a short stint in a in a zen buddhist monastery like you know in a in a very remote fishing village and um it was really that moment that um birthed finding space my my uh quote unquote business um but a lot of what i guess i learned through like uh i guess zen buddhism and their and their teachings is that you know there's not much to life but there is a whole lot as well um and if we can grasp i guess that fact that it's as simple as we want to make it and as colorful and beautiful and deep as we want to you know explore then it is simply up to us to be able to you know unravel that experience of life for ourselves and live that in each and every moment of our lives um so although i teach meditation and um i'm a big big advocate and practitioner of it on a daily basis uh it is by no means the only thing that i feel uh i represent or advocate for because you know uh it is just one of the tools and vehicles that really teach us how you know to to live a better life in my mind so can you give us some tips with meditation yeah i mean where where do i start i mean firstly i think we have to sort of debunk the fact all all the um stereotypical views and um misconceptions of what meditation is right um meditation doesn't necessarily need to be you know in a beautiful setting when you're in you know on 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 a on a high mountain that's remote and sitting in the lotus position with your hands on your lap and chanting 
om, right? It doesn't need to necessarily do that. You don't necessarily need to, you know, uh, be in that posture at all. Uh, you don't even need to close your eyes or it, it's, it's really just about noticing and having, paying a deep attention, like deeper than what your intellectual eye, you know, sees, right? And it's about training that in any moment in life. So um, every moment can be a meditative moment if you, you know, practice this, like you can walk through life um, and see it through a lens of meditation um, if you are practiced enough in it um so i guess to like at the start we must first debunk the fact that you know meditation is about sitting and de-stressing and you know getting better sleep and all these sorts of things like of course these are uh, beautiful benefits of meditation but it's not what it's about in my mind right it's really just about cutting through the noise and i just love the analogy of if we um, and our minds represented uh, a, a cup of muddy water and it's continually being stirred and stirred and stirred and stirred. Well, it's moving at quite a fast velocity and you won't be able to see much uh, within this swirling cup of muddy water. But if you just let it still and sit still and stop stirring, eventually it will come to rest and all the dirt will you know, sink to the bottom and you'll be able to see clearly all the way down to the bottom of the cup. So I think that that, you know, is a great analogy and um, way to sort of paint the picture of what meditation uh, is, right, for me, in my mind. So I personally, when I first um, I am asked about um, any tips for beginners and how to start meditation, I just say, look, don't get overwhelmed by it. Like, you know, um, people are like, oh, I don't want to sit for more than like 10 minutes and things like this. Um, Start with five minutes and, you know, don't even think about meditating. All I want you to do is have two things, you know, um, that you are practicing. Just sit and breathe, you know. And it's as, um, it's as practical as that. You're not even trying to meditation at this moment. You just want to sit and you just want to breathe. Um, and, you know, slowly once you start to notice what happens within your body, you know, even for a five minute period, uh, if you did that for, you know, 30 days straight, um, I guarantee you there will be some, you know, change in your perception of how you see the practice. And perhaps it'll pique your curiosity to practice for a longer stint and then, you know, explore what else you can within your body that occurs as you are in this still state and your mind, you know, starts to, you know, not, not necessarily quieten, but you will be aware enough to um, notice the thought and see it pass by. Um, so yeah, it's it's just one of those things. It's very hard to teach in my mind. Um, in my program, I start off with something similar, an entry level for the first module. It, it is about you know doing something similar as I just um, you know described. Um, just to get someone uh, really connected from an emotional and, and uh, visceral standpoint first, you know, and I call it just dropping out of your mind and into your body. And if we can do that um, as a starting point, uh, then you sort of you peek your foot into the door of meditation. Yeah, I like that. It is just getting your foot in the door with it. And as you say, it's, I'm sure you're a great teacher at it, but it is the experience and we can hear about how to do it over and over again, but actually you've got to get out of your head and you just have to experience it and see what happens. Yep. hundred percent. My only exposure or not my only exposure, actually, actually it was my dad who he, I think he had like a second lease on life. And I remember him learning how to meditate and going to these Buddhist weekends away Mm. Um, and staring at a candle flame. There's so many different methods out there. Yep. But my first proper experience myself with meditation was Vipassana meditation. And that is quite full on for a lot of people. And I now know with all the work that I do and I personality type my clients, I know the ones where it's going to be too much for them, but I still like yep. to let them know about it so that maybe they can dip their toe in and try that out. But I say there's so many different meditations out there. Just try whatever comes up for you and see if it resonates, but give it a go. 
Totally. Um, but I remember being in Vipassana. I've done several and did one when I was pregnant. And my first one, I was like, this is amazing. If the whole world meditated, we would not have issues because we would become so much more aware of our physical body and our emotions and all the answers come to us. But I think Absolutely. Maybe it, it does take some people, a few Vipassanas before they get to that stage and some people never go back and try again. But I remember mm. meeting people with chronic pain who had gone to see all the best specialists out there. And after a meditation session, they were highly aware of the sensation, but they didn't react to it. Like they didn't move out of the position. And because they sat there for an hour, they got up, something released, audibly cracked in their body. And then it's like everything just clicked into place like dominoes for them. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that it happens with every time you go to a passion, but I've heard numerous stories like that. So I always love talking to people on day 11 whenever it is you're allowed to open your mouth and just hear people's stories and their experience. And yeah. I think some people crave and, you know, we learn in meditation not to crave or have aversions and want that other person's experience. But sometimes you just have to keep going and that's your journey. And I think a lot of people set unrealistic expectations on themselves. So I personally don't meditate right now, although you talked about just sitting and breathing. And I remember coming out of my accounting meeting yesterday and feeling a little bit stressed and going, I just need to sit and breathe as I drive home and just yeah. try and embody the state of calm that I know that I can, that I can elicit in myself. But yeah, I don't put pressure on myself to go and meditate for an hour morning and night, which is the Vipassana way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, a hundred percent, like you said, I mean, there's, there's so many things that I want to touch on, like based on what you just mentioned, but um, you know, a couple of things like in, in the way that I teach, it's, it's not necessarily any sort of um, particular, I guess, uh, doctrine or, or methodology of method, uh, meditation. It's really just based on my, my lived experience of what I thought were the foundational principles that teach every individual to some degree, just to, highlight the cues that we should maybe look out for uh, <clears throat> more on a sensory, visceral, emotional level as we are giving ourselves the space to do so through meditation, um, to be able to be aware. And once we find those, then let's, let's be curious about them, you know, follow those threads and see where they take us. You know, uh, like you said, in, in, in any sort of instance, we give the opportunity to, we are given the opportunity to meditate like, uh, some uh, parts of my program, I, I sort of explain, like, you know, if you're washing the dishes, you know, it can be just a, a task of washing the dishes and you're sort of wanting to just get through the, the, the process of, you know, um, you know, cleaning these dirty dishes, or you can hear the water as it comes out of the tap. And you can see as the water changes trajectory, as it hits like a spoon, you know, and cascades down and how that changes the, the sound of the water. And then you can hear like the subtle little bubbles and suds just like, you know, crackling away in the background. And all these sorts of things, there's like so much nuance in everything that we can do and possibly do, you know, even when we're driving and things like this, there's a difference between us like try, just trying to speed away and being conscious of time to get to the next meeting or whatever, versus really being aware of what is happening around us as we're driving, you know, the feeling of the, uh, our butts in the seats and our, our hand on the steering wheel and you know the different sounds that are uh, occurring close within the car and the, the sounds that are occurring you know far away outside of the car um, and then you know the most advanced like sort of techniques is like you said about you know um, acknowledging uh, sensations like pain and as just another bodily sensation no different to anything else in your body right um, you, once you can sort of see pain uh, in your body as simply another, you know, uh, just some uh, another sensation that you feel, you know, outside of happiness and, you know, sadness and anything else, a physical sensation that you feel, um, it just becomes another point of focus for you as you meditate and uh, a point of inquiry as to why you might be feeling that way in that particular part of your body as you're sitting, you know, at the 45 minute mark, you know. Um, so it's really about just getting real, real deep and like, you know, exploring uh, the world 
within yourself, really, I feel. Yeah, I was just smiling when you were talking about washing the dishes because I was thinking this morning that I know when things are super calm in my life because I actually enjoy washing the clothes, not physically washing them, but, you know, putting them in the washing machine and then hanging them up and not Mm. just like biffing them on the line and like hating seeing the piles of washing just overload me and overwhelm me. So yeah, that's when I know I'm in a good space when I can actually appreciate and I enjoy hanging the clothes on the washing line rather than thinking, God, I wish I could hire someone to just do my washing and fold it and put it away for me. (laughs) (laughs) I I always say that that's like, again, it's part of the practice and a a way for you to like, you know, recenter and just, um, be aware of those you you know that like you know it doesn't matter what task it is that you're doing like like you said washing the uh the clothes and hanging it out on the line you know you are capable of feeling joy within you know those tasks like i felt that uh and first understood it whilst i was you know taking the clothes off the line at the zen buddhist monastery when, when i was doing the work there and i was just folding the towels into these like beautiful crisp squares and they were all aligned and like I, I, I felt like there was like a moment of like, just, you know, I was right there, enlightenment almost. It was so joyful. Um, and I was just folding towels, you know? So uh, every moment, like no matter how, how difficult, like quote unquote things might be, I think <laughs> that like, you know, uh, understanding like labor is, is a, a, a critical part of, you know, everyday life I feel is like, it's, it's really a, a beautiful thing. Oh, it definitely is. Is there anything else you want to share before I go into how people can find you? Oh, um, look, I don't traditionally like to sort of feel like I'm marketing myself. Um, I, all I will offer is, I guess, if anyone resonated with anything that I've said and feel to, I guess, inquire further and want to connect with me, um, you know, uh, I'm sure I'll have an opportunity to share some of my, um, my, my details and where they can find me and things like this. I do have things going on. Um, but yeah, I think it's really important that, um, you know, that, that, that I represent myself in this way and that I'm not necessarily trying to use this as any form of uh, marketing platform. Uh, I just share my truth. And if people resonate with that, then beautiful. But if not, then, that's also beautiful. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. I think what you've shared is very interesting and I think it will speak to the people out there in finance who are good at their jobs, but absolutely hating it and just getting them to reflect on where they could be if they continue down that path and hopefully don't end up with, you know, a diagnosis that makes you face your own, own mortality, as you say. Mm. So, I, yeah, I would love you to share where it is people can find you. Yep. Because you do, sure. yeah, you share lots of interesting information. And I think meditation is a really um, core part to healing yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, firstly, I just want to say thanks for the invite. I uh, really like talking with you. And, um, you know, uh, I think that you and I, uh, we, I, I do resonate with you and the message and, and the work that you do. So, so thank you for the, uh, the platform, um, just for me to share my, my truth. Um, people can find me at my website, findingspace.co. Um, you can find out about my meditation program there as well as my uh, one-on-one mentorship programs. Uh, I do only mentor a limited number of people per year, just so that um, I'm able to give the adequate attention to each individual. Um, but yeah, you can inquire about that through my website, uh, you know, and, and anything else that is sort of coming up, up uh, for me, um, whether it's on Instagram and Facebook as well. My handle is at findingspace.co. Um, and I guess the last thing that I might share is uh, the new program that um, my podcast co-host, uh, Sean, and I uh, have recently launched is uh, the True North program. Uh, we're sort of running uh, a small, intimate, transformational program that runs over six weeks uh, to essentially help people um, prepare for the journey of, of, of um, you know, self-inquiry and self-exploration. Um, so if you want to find out more about that, it's um, the details at true-north.co. How long is that program? It's a six-week program. 
Okay, great. Yeah. And is it open to men and women or do you just work with men? Yep, yeah. open to men and women. And um, the, I guess the important thing is it, it is uh, by application only. We only take a limited number of people just to make sure that it is interactive and intimate. Um, but like I said, uh, application just to ensure that uh, you are uh, in the right place for us to be able to guide you along this journey. So um, open to men and women by application only. And um, yeah, uh, there was one other point that I wanted to make is that yes, we run multiple cohorts uh, throughout the year. So just check the website to find out when the next cohort is launching. Cool, sounds great. And I'm sure that if it's not the right fit for them, you'll point them in the right direction. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your time, Leslie, and sharing your story. Thank you for the platform again. Thank you.